Greetings. Uh, welcome to Lit with Lloyd. Uh, I am your host, Lloyd Russell. Uh, and today, uh, our guest is Jim Chardella, who has written a book about a Ferrari dealership in Los Gatos that uh, I think is going to be much more interesting than maybe the way it sounds, because there is this is something to, to really uh, get a hold of. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Pleasure I, to be here. Okay, I'm glad to have you. Uh, Thank you. Let me start by asking you, uh, because your bio says, uh, you know, Ferrari enthusiast. Yes. What made you become an, a Ferrari enthusiast, and when did that happen? Well, I'm Italian, so first of all, <laughs> Italians and Ferraris go together. Uh, it's pretty hard to find an Italian that doesn't love Ferraris. So I've always liked Ferraris, uh, even way back when I was a, was a kid. Um, and I, you know, I always said that's going to be a car I'm going to get someday. And I, I was just, um, I was real fortunate to move to Los Gatos and, and meet Brian, who was the, the founder of Ferrari of Los Gatos. But uh, yeah, it's been in my blood for a long time. Okay, so tell us um, how this book came to be. So The Dreamer is about the Ferrari dealership here in town. And yeah. for those that don't know, um, uh, I have been in Los Gatos for 40 plus years. Yeah. Uh, I know Brian because his kids went to the same school that uh, my kids went to. Yeah. Uh, and um, of course, I have passed the Ferrari dealership through the years many, many times. Mm -hmm. So how did it come to happen? How did you end up meeting him? Uh, we'll start with that before we get to the book. Sure. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I moved to Los Gatos. Um, oh gosh, now it's got to be over 15, 16 years ago. And uh, I had a good friend that was living here, Bill Glau. He was well known in town and I came to have dinner with him one night at uh, Forbes Mill Steakhouse. Uh, and um, he said, oh, I wanted you to meet a friend of mine. This is my friend, Brian. And I reached over and shook Brian's hand and uh, he said, uh, Brian used to own the Ferrari dealership here in town. And of course, I almost fell off my chair and <laughs> I said, oh boy. I always wanted a Ferrari. It's, it's been a dream of, of my life for a long time. And uh, it was so funny because the, the next words that came out of Brian's mouth were, do you still want one? <laughs> and I realized he was in his sales mode that he'd always been in. So uh, I said, absolutely. And so uh, he told me about a Ferrari that he knew was uh, uh, available. And it only had 12,000 original miles on it. It was a 1982 uh, 308 model. And uh, it was, uh, I don't know if you remember um, Magnum PI back in the yes, 1970s sure. and 80s. Well, that, was, that was really got me hooked on Ferraris. When I saw Tom Selleck driving around Hawaii <laughs> in that uh, red Ferrari, I said, boy, that's the car I'd like someday. So, uh, and that's the model that it was. It was the same model, a 1982 that Tom had driven around in Hawaii and um, same color and everything that I wanted. So long story short, I, I told him, I'll take it. And of course, the next thing he said to me is, no, no, Jim, that's not the way you do it. Unless you or someone you trust has seen the car, you don't buy it. So <laughs> we'll go this weekend and take a look at it. And if you still want it, then we can talk about it. So um, that's how I met Brian. I bought the car and I still have it today. It's uh. got about 16,000 miles on it now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was how it happened. Wow. Now, as far as... Uh, the next part, getting to, to how did the book come out of that, um, Brian and I just became friends because we both lived on the same street. Uh, we lived on Masol here in town and we used to walk downtown to have dinner and uh, we ended up a couple nights a week having dinner together and he was telling stories. He just was nonstop and I was like in shock most of the time. Another story, another this, well, this is unbelievable, all this stuff that went on. And uh, he finished every story. You know, somebody ought to write a book about this. And I'm not kidding. That's the way he would finish his stories. And I uh, listened to that for a long time. And uh, one night I just said, you know what, Brian, I'll write the book. He looked at me kind of strange and he said, well, how are you gonna write the book? You're an accountant. Because that's been my profession. I've been in finance all my life. And I said, you know what, Brian, I'll figure it out. 
I, I mean, I knew I had done a lot of writing and work, but never a book, but yeah. I, I could figure it out. And, uh, and I went back to school, actually. I was, uh, I was 60 years old or 61 years old, and I, went to, I took a class at Stanford on creative nonfiction writing. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it was, that's a whole other story you could probably write a book about. <laughs> but anyhow, that's, that's how it came about. How long did it take you from the time you uttered those words Whoa. to actually having <clears throat> this book right here and for everybody to see? <laughs> well, it's, it, it was actually 10 years from the days I uttered those words wow. until the book was published. However, um, there was a six-year period where I kind of gave up on the book this was uh, I had worked on it probably for a year maybe a little longer and um, I, I, I actually I got a new job that was taking a lot of my time the book sat on the shelf I, I didn't do anything on it for six years and um, so that was probably four years ago four to five years ago and um, I heard a motivational speaker say something about if you have a dream and you don't go after it uh, and you end up leaving this earth and your dream ends up in the cemetery, that's a horrible thing to do. Wow. And I also, I had made a commitment to my dad uh, before he passed that I was gonna write a book. I wanted to write a book with him. It didn't happen, but I thought, you know what? I can't let this book just sit on the shelf. And so I got a hold of Brian and I said, Brian, we're gonna do this. And then we, we, we hit, started hitting it pretty heavy. I started spending a lot of time at his house. Uh, we'd do one, one and a half, two hour interviews. Uh, I would record everything that he told me. And then uh, I'd have it transcribed and then I'd go and digest it. And that's, I probably have 40 or 50 hours of him talking and then wow. other people talking as well. Other employees and people that were associated with the dealership. And um, that's what I used to, to write the book those recordings wow put them into a little bit different words we actually did a blog for a while for a year or two I had a blog and I, every week I'd put out a little short snippet about something that was going to be in the book yeah uh, hopefully I didn't give away too much <laughs> but uh, yeah that's that's uh, how it came about all right so uh, we don't want to have you tell us <laughs> all that's in the book sure but but when did he open the dealership and how did that happen? Yeah, so, um, you know, Brian also fell in love with Ferraris when he was a young boy. He was probably about 10 years old. His dad uh, was an artist and his dad was very famous. Uh, he was a cutaway artist, they called him. And that's where he actually would draw a car, how it looked in the inside. So he, he talked seeing a car from the inside out. They almost sliced the car in half and and draw it and uh, he became famous because he was in the initial uh, issues of hot rod magazine back in the late 40s and, and early 50s and he just became known as the father of cutaway uh, drawings and um, so Brian was around cars and all his life uh, even as a young boy but at a at a SCCA uh, sports car club of America race when he was about 10 years old uh, Jim Kimberly was a famous driver back then. He started up a, a red Ferrari. Oh my and gosh. Brian was pretty close to it when it started up that 12 cylinder engine sound. You know, that Ferraris have a sound and he fell in love with it and he said, you know, that's, that was for him. Um, and so uh, when he, uh, he was always been in the car business and when he got the opportunity uh, to do a dealership uh, here in Los Gatos, that's that's what he went for he it wasn't easy but uh, he along with a partner Richard Revor um, they became partners and they opened up the uh, the dealership uh, and that was in 1976 wow so um, yeah, 76 and the book uh, really spans well it talks a little bit about Brian's life before then but it it really spans those that 20 years from 76 to 95 when when uh, unfortunately Brian lost the dealership at uh, in 1995 and that's a another another part of the book this is this book is is not just about cars it's about the rise and fall of a a very successful business uh, yeah dealership became the number one dealership Ferrari dealership in North America 
and wow. maybe even in the world at that time uh, in the 1980s. And um, yeah, just very, very successful. And uh, then through some, some uh, unfortunate circumstances, things changed after Enzo Ferrari died in 1988. Oh, wow. uh, the, new, the new regime that we like to say that came in and started running Ferrari had a different idea ah. about how to do things. And uh, they wanted to make the dealerships uh, company owned stores factory stores and uh, they ended up pretty much putting all the dealers in Northern California, uh, sorry, not Northern California, North America out of, out of business. So it's a, uh, yeah. Wow. It did, it did, did Ferrari then open it their own? Well, in some cases they took over the dealerships. Um, the first dealership that they, they actually bought was the San Francisco dealership. And then they moved it up to Marin County and that became the first company owned store huh. in, in North America. Um, you have to understand that the, it was extremely successful. Um, when a few years before Brian opened the dealership, uh, in, in here in Los Gatos, uh, Ferrari wasn't even selling a hundred cars a year in North America. Within about three to four years after the dealership opened, they were selling a thousand cars a year in North America. Wow. So they had a 10 X multiplier there wow. pretty quickly. And, uh, Enzo Ferrari really took notice of that. He appreciated it so much. Um, Enzo really wasn't into selling cars. He was into racing. The world knows that. Yeah. But he knew he had to sell cars to get the money to build the race cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he uh, he brought the dealers over to Italy a few times to show his appreciation, show them the factory. There's a there's a chapter in the book called Marinello, and it's all about the trips that they went on. Uh, pretty remarkable stuff. Uh, talks about some things uh, at the factory that you know the normal person would never see or experience. Uh, they took the dealers out on the Formula One race tracks, wow. test, test tracks and uh, test drivers uh, gave them rides in the cars and scared the heck out of them. And <laughs> there's a story about that in there as well. But um, yeah, that's uh, it was a very, very interesting 20 year ride for Brian. Yeah. So I, I, I gather that he was not ready to close it when he had to close it. No, so when when Ferrari decided that they wanted to take over the dealerships, uh, many of the dealers um, said fine because uh, most of the dealers were not uh, just Ferrari dealers. Uh huh. Brian had Ferraris; those were the only new cars that he sold. Most of the other dealers uh, had a BMW dealership or a Ford or Chevy dealership, and the Ferrari dealership was just next door. And it was, it was fun for them, and it was the status symbol for them. But whether they sold a Ferrari or not didn't matter to them that much. They were making their money on the other cars that, where the volume was. Brian, on the other hand, uh, he had only Ferraris to sell. And as well as this dealership here had you know, hot rods, muscle cars, other classic cars as well. And then he sold used Ferraris as well. Most of the other dealerships in the country it was brand new Ferraris and that's it. I wouldn't take trade-ins, didn't want to see any other cars on huh. the lot, just, just new Ferraris. And so the dealership here was very different, um, even from the standpoint of the way the salesman dressed. Uh, Brian didn't allow them to wear anything except Levi's and polo shirts. <laughs> he said, no suits and ties. You know, I want my customers to feel comfortable when yeah. they're here. And, yeah. and uh, so it, it was very different. Um, they had many... Um, they did things that different than the other dealers too. They, they took uh, trade-ins. It was unheard of at the time. They financed uh, the cars. They figured out how to get a financing program for people so that just about the average person off the street could afford a Ferrari. That was the idea where most of the other dealers were, you know, if you weren't wealthy or famous, you weren't going to be buying a Ferrari. <laughs> you know, they, you, you wouldn't even go in on the lot. Wow. So very different. So he actually opened it with a partner. Yes. And did the partner stay with him that whole 19 years? No, they they split up after about three or four years. It's a real interesting uh, twist or turn of events. And uh, it's again covered in the book. Um, Brian actually left the dealership and uh, some things happened and he ended up getting the dealership back. Oh, wow. Um, maybe 
four to six months after he actually left. And it wasn't something he planned. It just was fate and twist turn of events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we definitely don't want to give all the <laughs> the, the fun stuff yeah. here. Uh, are there any stories? Can you pick a story or two that you're comfortable telling us uh, uh, about the dealership? Sure. I think, though, before I get into the stories, one of the things that I, I, I want to mention is, and I, I just, I've, I've got uh, just almost goosebumps being here because the, we're, we're at the campus of yeah. La, Las Gatas High School. Yeah. And um, this is where Brian went to high school. His, <laughs> he, he, he came here. His family got relocated here from Georgia when he was in the 12th grade. So he, he did his last year of high school here. And then um, the dealership's just was a couple blocks yeah um, i mean really just a block away well, across block the street away. and then uh, a lot of things happened uh, that were related to the high school as well one of which uh, this will give you one story <laughs> there was a, a famous baseball player for the san francisco giants his name was jack clark um he he was a incredible ball player best at best there was in his position and still today owns the hitting streak 26 games in a row no Giants done that since 1900. And, um, but he bought a Ferrari, sight unseen, from, from the dealership. Huh. And when he came with his family to pick it up, uh, he ended up sitting in the car, and the salesman was watching through the window, and Brian said to the salesman, your customer's not moving. <laughs> so he said, ah, he probably can't figure out how to release the parking brake or something <laughs> like that. So he walked out and said, what, what's up? And Jack said, I don't know how to drive a stick shift. I didn't realize these cars only came with stick shifts. So they brought them, they got them, the salesman got in the car with them and they came and spent half an hour, 45 minutes here in the Los Gatos High School parking lot teaching Jack Clark how to drive his Ferrari. Oh my gosh. This was, uh, so, you know, these were stories that I heard over the years and then this, is, this story is actually in the book. So being here with you and, and being able to do this right here on this campus is, uh, is pretty incredible. Cool. All so, right, well, we're going to take a quick break okay. and then we're going to get back into... To, I want to talk also about uh, the publishing process. Sure. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be right back. Thank you to the Los Gatos Community Foundation for their continued support of KCAT Public Media. Because of groups like the Los Gatos Community Foundation, KCAT has been able to inspire, educate, entertain, and inform our community through the magic of television and digital media for over 38 years. Thank you. And we are back with Jim Chardella. Uh, we're going to try to get a few stories out of him, but not so many <laughs> that, that you know, we can't sell a book. So let's get back to it. Sure. Uh, okay. So, uh, by the way, I can't drive a stick. <laughs> <laughs> After my seven plus decades of life, I still have never driven a stick. Wow. So I can feel what Jack Clark was at least going through initially. Yeah. That's, that's funny. Yeah. Um, anything out there? I mean, I know there's a million stories, but... Uh, anything else that you feel comfortable telling us about or throwing a few names yeah. out that uh, that uh, Brian was involved with? Sure, sure. So one of the things that um, attracted a lot of uh, entertainers to the dealership was, well, it was well known, but also, you know, we have the Mountain Winery here where there's uh, concerts on yep. a regular basis and it brings in some of the top entertain entertainment from around the world. Yeah. And uh, so several of them, it, it, it was whenever they came here to play, they made sure that they they stopped at um, uh, at the uh, at the dealership to to just see uh, what was what was available. Um, one that I can remember that was pretty memorable was uh, Rod Stewart. So Rod Stewart, <laughs> uh, it, it, this was actually um, in the '90s. Rod Stewart wanted the F40, which was a model that came out uh, the year after Enzo passed away. He, it was the last car that Enzo really had his hands in and involved with the design. And so it was very hard to find, very popular car, and, and Rod wanted one. And you know, these, they were selling for over a million dollars 
a, a copy, uh, some as high as a one and a half million dollars. Wow. And again, this was in the early 1990s. Mm. So we're talking, what, 20, yeah. 25 years yeah. ago. <laughs> that was a lot of money. I mean, it's still a lot of money, but really a lot of money yeah. back then. But anyhow, um, he was he was so happy that Brian found one, had one on the lot for him, that he uh, sent a limo to pick up Brian and uh, the sales team and brought him to his concert. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, Rod's concert was... Uh, at Shoreline, uh, okay, there was another uh -huh. there was another venue that drew a lot of good people. Yep. So Brian uh, had uh, limo service to and put right in the front row, and uh. Rod Stewart took care of him, put him up in a in a hotel in downtown Palo Alto afterwards, and just it was really that. So there's that kind of thing in there. That's so cool. Um, there's another story about um, there was a gentleman named Reuben that worked for Brian uh, the whole time, the whole twenty years that uh, Brian was there, and he. Uh, he um, his main job was to go and pick up cars or deliver cars uh, when when uh, Brian would buy a used one somewhere or something like that, or he would deliver a new car to a customer. And so one one year he had a, the Brian had a customer in Hollywood that bought the car, and Reuben had to deliver the car to her in her Hollywood mansion. Uh -huh. And uh, so he went down there, and the deal was okay, Reuben. You drive the car down. When you get done, you take a taxi back to the airport, get a plane, and then we'll pick you up at, I think it was 4 p.m. in the afternoon um, and uh, at the airport, San Jose Airport. So go to pick him up, and he's not there. <laughs> Salesman calls Brian and says, Brian, I don't know what happened. Uh, Ruben's not here. He says, oh, gee, that's, un that's strange. I'll call him. So he called him and uh, on his cell phone. Ruben answered his phone. And he said, what are you doing? You're supposed to be back here. And he said, she won't let me leave. <laughs> and so I'm going to tell you who it is in yes, a minute. But yes, I'm you are. Trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to make this good. <laughs> she won't let me leave. And he said, well, what do you mean? And then a, a, a female voice comes on the phone and says, this is Cher. You leave Ruben alone. Oh, he'll, he'll be home when I want him to go home. Oh, my gosh. And, and, and Brian said, uh, excuse me? And it was click. <laughs> she hung up on him. So, <laughs> so Ruben was delivering a car to a brand new Ferrari to Cher. And uh, she just decided that, you know, they were going to have some fun there and do some things together. And so... Uh, Ruben came back to the dealership. He came back the next day, and he had autographed photos from Cher for everybody that worked there. But oh my gosh! In the in the book, we call it uh, we call it the kidnapping. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you had things like that. Um, gosh, I don't know. There, there there's there's many other stories. There's stories about um, some of the uh, CEOs uh, for the, back in the in the Silicon Valley uh -huh. CEOs. Uh, Jim Tribig, who was the founder of Tandem Computers. Um, he was a local resident, and uh, one Sunday he was jogging in his in his shorts and T-shirt and tennis shoes, and he happened to jog by the dealership, <laughs> and he saw a Ferrari in the in the win in the window in the showroom that he really liked, and so he went in and he, s he said, "I want to buy it," and uh, they they let him take it home, and so. <laughs> He was so shocked because he didn't have his checkbook with him. He didn't have his ID. He didn't have anything. Uh, and uh, he actually got interviewed by the New York Times about this. Oh, my gosh. And it appeared in the in the paper that he said, these people are so good at this dealership. They let me take the car home. And there's no way they could have known who I really was. And, you know, wow. the, the way I looked in, in jogging shorts. Yeah, yeah. So there's, a, there's a, you know, sports people, entertainers. CEOs, there's a lot of, a lot of real uh, well-known people, and there's a few more in there, I, 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 which I'm going to read about. <laughs> uh, would would Brian still have the dealership if Enzo were alive, or if the successors to Enzo uh, kept the same kinds of of uh, you know programs and things? Well, you know, this is what now, 30, 40 years later, but uh, so. You know, I'm sure Brian would have probably retired by now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. There was no way Brian wanted to lose the dealership. Yeah. He was the one dealer who stood up to Ferrari and said, no, uh, you're not taking my dealership. I'll fight you. You can't take it away from me. And, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to fight somebody as big and powerful right, as right. Ferrari. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you, I mean, obviously, 
as you said, celebrities came from around uh, the country, at least, and even though they were here for, for events. But where was the next closest dealership? Yeah, so there was the dealership in San Francisco. Okay. And then there was one in Monterey. Okay. So it was kind of right in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was was no no you had to go what an hour or so either direction to get to another dealership. right 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 and as you said there was shoreline uh you know there was uh uh mountain winery yeah uh and yeah. and several other you know good-sized establishments sa uh, sap center yes yeah so i could see where there'd be a lot of people right here Absolutely. uh okay you wrote you, you finished the book mm-hmm and what did you do then? How did you go through the publishing process? Great, great uh, question. And um, it was it was uh, it was an experience. I'll tell you. The um, I went to, uh, first thing I did. Well, I hired a, a coach. Nina Amir is her name, and she was wonderful. She sounds familiar. That yeah, name she, sounds familiar. She lived here in Los Gatos for for a long time. Um, she's she's written a lot of books, and and uh, I really have her to thank. I write about her in the in the back of the book, but I have her to thank for for helping me with this because uh, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, but it started with putting a really good book proposal together mm -hmm. to get an agent, mm -hmm. because right. if you're going to go through a publisher, you need an agent. You, you can't, you know, you can self-publish, but you can't publish without an agent. Um, so I put a, a proposal together and. Um, uh, Nina helped me with that and then we started looking for agents and it took me I, I write about it in the book I, I, uh, it took me I think it was around 400 days to find an agent uh -huh. I found a, 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 a great agent um, uh, Ann Devlin and uh, she found me a publisher in 40 days wow. which was incredible yes um, but during that 400 days I received at least 160 to 170 rejections uh, or non-answers yeah yeah yep. just didn't respond yeah but I have to say most of them were pretty good they did respond uh, a lot of them said things like uh, well this sounds like a very interesting book but it's not in my genre or not up my alley and so you know good luck with it um, I had a couple that said, I'd really like to do it, but I'm just too busy right now. Well, Anne, when Anne, uh, I'll tell you how, how this you know, things happen in life. I mean, everything happens for a reason, but a movie came out uh, two or three years ago called Ford versus sure. Ferrari. Great movie. Great movie. Yeah. Um, I thought, oh, this is just, this is, you know, sign yeah. from heaven here. Yeah, this is yeah. going to bring people, get people interested. So my agent actually knew nothing about cars. <laughs> almost nothing about Ferraris, huh. but her husband convinced her to go see the movie Ford versus Ferrari. She loved the movie. Uh. About two weeks after she saw the movie, my, my query letter showed up. Oh my gosh. And she said, oh, I gotta find out about this. So she requested my book proposal. Wow. Most of the agents didn't request the book proposal. And so I sent it to her and uh, she loved it. She said, this is one of the best book proposals I've ever seen. I don't know if she was just trying to make me feel good or what, <laughs> but um, she ended up, um, uh, we, I ended up signing with her. And like I say, within about 40 days, one of the things I did, and I think it's really important, is that when somebody, when an agent is interested, you need to do some due diligence and check out. I called five or six other authors that she had represented uh -huh. or emailed them and just said, what do you, would you hire her again? How did she do for you? Almost exclusively, all of them told me I had spent a long time looking for an agent, but once I found Anne within, within a few months, I got a publisher. Wow. And so that impressed me, you know, because I'd already been sitting around for 400 days. <laughs> I didn't want to go much more. But um, yeah, she, she's been one, she was wonderful. She got me uh, the, the uh, Roman and Littlefield uh, are the publishers of the book. And so. It's a very well-known international publisher. It got me a lot of, you know, exposure uh, worldwide. Hopefully, we're gonna 
be able to do some some sales with it internationally as well. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, we actually did receive one order from the United Kingdom already uh-huh. in the first 30 days. I was wow. shocked. And uh, the the uh, I have a website where I sell the book and uh, this gentleman said, I, I, I told my marketing person I want to buy the book and she said, you know, this is going to be a lot of freight to get it to the UK. We're offering free freight right now, but free shipping, but that's if it's in the United States. <laughs> so he said, I don't care what it costs. And he ended up paying almost as much for the shipping as the book. Wow. <laughs> so, but uh, well, he, he the, wanted it. The only part of that story that I find so incredible and slightly unbelievable is that you actually went to, did all that due diligence instead of just grabbing the first agent that said yes. That's really impressive. Well, I'll tell you another part of the story, which <laughs> I really haven't shared with anybody. I hope my agent never hears this, but uh, she she was she really wanted to sign with me and put the contract in front of me and everything. And honestly, I had no other. There was no other option. Right. It was go with her or don't go at all. But I said to her, I said, you know, Ann, I, 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 I think I, I would like to do business with you, but I, I need to just do a little bit of due diligence. I got to figure out what options I have here. She said, oh, I totally understand. And then, um, you know, I, I did. I spent about a week doing that. But when I came back to her and I said, let's put a deal together, when we finally signed everything, she said, Jim, I just want to ask you one question. Why did you pick me over the other options you had? <laughs> I said, well... I can't really tell the truth here. So I'm, not, I'm not supposed to lie, but because I didn't have any other options. Right. But I told her, I said, Ann, I chose you because of your references. They all told me what a great job you did, how quickly you did it, and that they would definitely do another book with you. So. And that's the truth. That, you that, did tell the truth. I told the truth. Oh my I didn't, God. I've never, but well, this would be the first time I ever let her <laughs> let, out, let the cat out of the bag that there weren't any other options, but. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I just, I find that incredible that you did that <laughs> instead of just snapping one up that finally said yes. That's really, really well done. Yeah. Sometimes you have to tell your brain, I'm running the show, not you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, do you have another book in mind? I do. Oh, good. Have you started it? Uh, I have. Well, yes. I mean... I haven't put uh, pen to paper. Uh, I do have a few things that I've I've typed up with ideas. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But it's um, it's a very different book. Uh, but it's the same style, I guess I would say. It's the story of somebody who was extremely successful, uh, and and has a very interesting story to tell. You know, I think of people. If people wanted to say, "Are you an author?" I would rather say, "I'm a storyteller," because that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, these are these are nonfiction stories. It's the truth. It's something that happened that's incredible, and hopefully, people would like to read about it. Um, so, so I'll I, I'll even I mean, if you want, I can tell you a little bit about it. Heck yes. Okay. So it's a gentleman that I met. Uh, he's down in uh, Southern California. His name is Chuck, and um, he. Uh, was born and raised in Texas, came out to California as a young man, and um, was a bodybuilder. He liked to lift weights and work out at the gym. Well, his roommate was a man named Jeff Gold. So if anybody's heard of Gold's Gym, which is very well known, this is the guy who started Gold's Gym. So Chuck and Jeff were roommates. They started Gold's Gym in their garage. Oh my gosh. So they converted the garage into a gym and the friends came over and people from around the neighborhood and they worked out together and just got to, got to you know, there, well, there's a lot of other stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm cutting to the chase here. Yeah, yeah. Um, ended up that uh, when he opened Gold's Gym and Chuck was there every day working out, uh, one of the customers, one of the clients that came into Gold's Gym was Arnold Schwarzenegger. So Arnold and Chuck became best friends. Ah. Okay, and so the whole the whole Muscle Beach, Venice Beach, all that stuff. Chuck lived it. Chuck wow. was part of it. I mean, Chuck and Arnold. But there was a third. Well, there were three Musketeers in this story, and the third person that was in Hollywood, uh, filming movies, and became very good friends with the two of them was Elvis Presley. Ah. So now uh, Chuck has just 
tons and tons of information uh, about what the three of them did. Oh my gosh! On Muscle Beach, uh, he has photographs. He has photographs of them working out together, playing basketball together. I mean, it's I it's just it blows you away. All all of the uh, wow. information that he what? has. Oh, and that's a great one. He said to me one day, "I always wanted to write a book about this." So I thought I was in the middle of this book, or I would have jumped on it right away because I. I just think it's it's so exciting. Oh, absolutely! And he um, he said to me, Jim, you write the book, but he said I wanna I wanna name the book because I've had a I've had a title for this book in my mind for many many years, and uh, I said okay, and and so he said I want to call the book Sin in the Sand, <laughs> the story of Muscle Beach, and so that's going to be my next book wow you know, god willing and the river don't rise yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i gotta tell you that that i'm not, i'm not thrilled to be done with this because you know our time is up okay but this has just been so so interesting well i've enjoyed it too so okay so thank we you. are closing the book on today's podcast i want to thank uh jim chardella for uh coming in tonight uh and i also want to thank uh kcat uh, who sponsors uh, the show and who uh, there? everybody there is just fantastic to work with. Uh, and we will see you next time. You just heard Lit with Lloyd here on KCAT Radio. Explore all our KCAT original programming at kcat.org slash radio. Mm-hmm.